Jeremy, uh, how are you? Thanks for doing this. Lots of questions for you, so I'm looking forward to it. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, fire away any questions that you have. Well, I guess the first would perhaps be a, an introduction of yourself, you know, for people that may not be aware of you or, you know, your Twitter account and what you've been doing, maybe a brief introduction to, I guess, and I know it's hard to make this too brief, but how you ended up in El Salvador and then what you're doing now. Sure. Basically, I'm originally from the United States. Uh, several years ago, I saw the writing on the walls. I wanted to get my family out. We traveled around for a while, but then the Bitcoin law passed in El Salvador, and I'm a longtime Bitcoiner, so it made all the sense in the world to come here and check it out. When I did, I fell in love with it, and we created Escape to El Salvador, which it can broadly be divided into to two categories. We have a residency side for what we do. We help people go from tourist to legal resident to permanent resident to citizen if that's what they want. And then we have a business side as well. So we can set up and help administer Salvadoran corporations so that you can get your business started in El Salvador with uh, eyes toward Bitcoin City. I got so many questions, but first one is what's it been like? I mean, I, I it seems like there's a lot of interest in people needing these services because they're looking at, you know, moving to El Salvador, immigrating to El Salvador. So, you know, what's it been like since you've been doing this work? Is there a lot of volume? Is there a lot of demand? You know, give me the scoop. Yeah, so a lot of folks have come down to kick the tires uh, for El Salvador. Maybe they visited for the conference. So we always like to plug adopting Bitcoin that happens every year in November. Uh, if you haven't been to El Salvador before and you want to come and see it for yourself, uh, the adopting Bitcoin conference is highly recommended. Uh, it's at a very good hotel uh, in a very good part of town. So you come and you see and you get a really good experience of what El Salvador is like. And there's always little field trips that will take you off into the countryside so that you can see a little bit of that and go surfing one day. Uh, so it's it's a great um, first visit and first touch for El Salvador if you're on the fence and, and, and want to come experience that. But basically over the last uh, couple of years since the Bitcoin law has passed, Obviously, Bitcoin enthusiasts uh, from all around the world have come here to see what it's all about. Um, but surprisingly, a lot of people that maybe uh, understand Bitcoin or know about Bitcoin, they use it, but that's not their primary reason. We get a lot of people who are here for uh, reasons around their own personal freedom and liberty, right? So they maybe they live in Canada or they live in a Western European country, and they thought that they had a relatively liberal democracy that they were living in. And uh, the events of the last several years has clued them into, well, maybe they're not quite as free as they thought they were. And so they stick their head up, they look around the world to see what uh, a good option might be for uh, a plan B or, or a second uh, home. And El Salvador hits a lot of the, uh, the main points. And so they come and they check it out and, and many decide to stay. You mentioned adopting Bitcoin. I watched your speech in preparation for this, which was excellent, by the way. You delivered it really well, and I thought it it, it landed. You know, you hit the major points. But in that speech, you basically, you know, you um, you flesh out this idea of of the refugee, right? And of course, we all have this image in our head of what a, a typical refugee looks like. But I think, especially in context of the last one, you know, twenty 2020 twenty to twenty twenty two. and ongoing, you know, because there's a lot of the what we might deem repression is chugging forward as you know there's been no end to it you know some things have scaled back for now like lockdowns and mandates but you know the world is still very much moving toward a a more authoritarian model let's say and yes. uh you know you made the argument that you know a, a refugee might just look like the mirror you know what you see in the mirror it might look like you and i think a lot of people especially that listen to this podcast and a lot of bitcoiners more broadly can you know, empathize or that, that resonates with them because so many, I think, are looking around their life today in whatever jurisdiction they may be in and just have had enough, you know, enough taxation, enough control, enough liberties taken away, enough censorship, enough being deplatformed, enough having to keep your mouth shut at work, just like totally enough and be like, I want something different. And for the longest time, there didn't appear to be a jurisdiction that could satisfy that. I mean, like, you know, everything moves in kind of lockstep. And there's many reasons for that, why so many jurisdictions you choose or are coerced to enforce the same policies all over the world. But then in, in 2021, you have El Salvador basically plant the flag and say, or at least promise, you know, the promise is, is always different from, from actuality, but at least um, signal that they're going to do things differently or that they want to do things differently. Um, and so, you know, I'd, I'd, maybe it's good to dig into that that a little bit, because I know, 
Well, I've heard because I my first trip to El Salvador was uh, in the fall of 2021. I heard in the early days of the COVID stuff, they were equally hysterical uh, to most other places. Now, it seems they did a a sooner, a quicker about face than most other places. And when they did do that about face, it looked like a, a genuine one. They, you know, started thinking more sensibly and perhaps uh, enacting more sensible policies. But what is your impression about that signal, the, 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 the truthfulness of that signal? Like, is El Salvador really that place that is trying to do things differently and trying to offer or permit people to have a, a greater degree of freedom than almost any other jurisdiction available in the world today. Yeah, so I think it's an authentic signal. And I think it's important to remember the environment that we were in for the first couple of weeks uh, after the news dropped, just around the, the, the COVID hysteria, right? Uh, there were a lot of people who were making very, uh, I think, uh, legitimate claims that the virus could have been engineered in a lab. Uh, and if the virus is engineered in a lab, then let's be realistic. We don't actually know how bad it could have been, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, an initial reaction that was very strong was appropriate, especially given the, the lay of the land in El Salvador. We don't have as developed, especially at the time, as developed a healthcare infrastructure as a lot of other countries. So even something that would be like a really bad flu could be disastrous in El Salvador because we don't have the infrastructure to deal with uh, just sort of the mass cases that, that could arise from even just a, a strong flu. So we did uh, uh, have a strong reaction, but you're absolutely right. Uh, among the first uh, countries to look at this and say, okay, we've had enough time to gather the data. We understand now what we're dealing with. And we also understand that there were additional reasons why people were uh, placing these rules and these restrictions in other countries, and we're not going to do that here anymore. And you'll note that that decision came in tandem with the announcing of the Adopting Bitcoin uh, conference, right? As people were starting to make their plans and decide whether or not they were going to go to El Salvador for adopting Bitcoin, that's when that decision was made. And uh, To lift for me, the entry requirement, you mean? Yeah, exactly. So I don't think that that was coincidental at all. I think no. that the administration was making a very clear signal to us and our community that they were going to, in fact, do it, uh, do things a different way. Yeah, I think you're right. And the point that I'll concede to all react, well, to, at the beginning, nobody knew what this was. Now, for what it's worth, my, my, uh, fundamental position or perspective on so much of what gets talked about and noticed in the mainstream and by government officials. Basically, I have like a inverse heuristic, right? So if, if they're talking about it and they're concerned about it, it's probably less likely to be of concern. If they're that's, not, it's probably good is. <laughs> right. So when, when everyone started freaking out and lockdowns were in consideration, all the kind of stuff, I was like, oh, this is probably the the, the wrong move, right? But what I, you know, and, and that's, I, I do genuinely, genuinely mean that, but there's a lot of nuance there. What I am fundamentally against is the assertion that should a emergency be extreme enough, you have to take people's liberties away. So right. I don't think anyone, as far as I'm concerned, nobody gets excused for um, an extreme response because I never think that's the right solution. It's like, oh my, the, the sky could be falling. Sure. Forcing people on threat of imprisonment or coercion or violence or whatever to you know, stay in their home or to be locked down somewhere or to do something that you deem they should do is a complete non-starter for me. So, you know, for me, that it's I think everyone is deserving of criticism who took that approach. But yes. I do, you know, of course it's good when people recognize the failure of a certain approach and change course. And it seemed to be the case, as you said, right before the the, the conference, there was a lot of Bitcoiners, I think, being vocal about that particular policy of, of you know, the VAX mandate to get in the country. And it seemed like they were, as you say, signaling to this crowd, like, we get it and it's gone. And I think after, the, you know, they put out some promotional stuff that was very counter to what everyone was putting out in terms of, you know, how to enhance your health and therefore mitigate the risks of the virus itself. I saw those, you know, blue boxes full of supplements and stuff go out. You can tell me if that was legit, but it seemed, you know, very forward thinking at the time when everyone was just, you know, vaccine crazy. So, you know, there, there's there's bright spots. It was a, a big fuck up, in my opinion, 
pretty much everyone did it, yes. but it seems like they're coming out of it with, you know, a, a more sensible approach. Do you think, because 2019 Bukele came into power, right? That's correct. As, as you, the president, he'd been in politics uh, prior to that. Yes. Yeah. I mean, do you think, you know, because 2020 was only a year later, do you, what, what do you make of kind of the momentum that he's been building in terms of his policies and the, the, and his free, you know, his ability to pass legislation and enact policies and that kind of stuff. What's been your impression? Yeah, so there's there's no doubt that President Bukele is going to go down in history uh, for some reason, and it's probably going to have to do with the Bitcoin law. But in my opinion, it should be because he is a a strategist of of unparalleled quality. He's been fighting so many different battles on so many different fronts and winning all of them, that it's absolutely incredible. Uh, when you talk about, uh, obviously, the response to the gang violence uh, here in El Salvador, that was just a tremendous accomplishment. It's going on to this day. It's, it's, it's certainly nothing that we're going to hang a, a mission accomplished banner on. But you've noticed the, the precipitous drop in, in violence. And, uh, you know, we're, we're very proud to hang the banner that, uh, you know, we're basically the safest country in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, and, and I think that that trend is going to continue for a long time. Yeah, that's remarkable. I mean, what do you, what do you make of, and this is, this is a tricky subject, so I'd love to get your perspective on it, but what do you make of the approach taken to resolve that particular problem with the gangs and the violence? So there's there's almost always economic interest at play, right? Uh, there's no country in the world that doesn't have some type of criminal cartel operating within it, right? Uh, and, and in some countries, they're worse than others. Uh, but corruption almost always uh, involves uh, police, and it almost always involves government officials. Uh, and so there's always this, this shadow world that's difficult to deal with because there are a lot of intractable interests, right? You may have this thug on the corner, you know, but he reports up to a boss who reports up to a boss who reports to a guy that lives in a $10 million mansion and, and can pull the strings uh, in the political mechanism, right? So whenever you want to actually go against uh, a criminal cartel, you ruffle a lot of feathers. Uh, and sometimes uh, uh, governments don't uh, actually do that or, or have the strength to try to do that. Um, El Salvador had a clear mandate we were at the bottom of the heap in terms of our situation around just the personal security uh, of the, the people walking around on the ground. Uh, and it had been going on for so many years. Uh, as many as 50 years of our recent past has been plagued by some form or another of the violence that, that we've been uh, eradicating over the last uh, several months, right? So the political will was there, and that's represented in the fact that the Nuevas Ideas Party, the New Ideas Party, which is what uh, Bukele is a, a part of, uh, managed to draw so much support from the far left uh, party and the far right party. They had existed prior to this, but now the Nueva Sedeus party uh, uh, it regularly achieves 80 to 90% uh, uh, approval ratings on the types of policies that they put out because they can truly be described as post-partisan. Uh, the, the policies that are being uh, discussed in the government today aren't ideological. Uh, they're uh, policies that are built around common sense approaches to reforming the government and to making life better for the people on the ground. And the, the numbers speak for themselves. The incredible popularity uh, of this approach has made President Bukele the most popular world leader in, at, at all, like the, no one, no one comes close. Second place is is way down the list, right? He's the most popular world leader, not just like within El Salvador. I'm talking when you when you broadcast and when you um, uh, take a poll of everyone around the world, uh, you know, uh, polling agencies from the United States, reputable agencies like Gallup, et cetera, you know, they consistently find this. So the numbers are the proof. Uh, people like what is being done. And uh, you can also see the numbers come in uh, in terms of tourism, dollars spent, and the uh, amazing investments that are going on in the country. Yeah. What, what do you make of the criticisms of Bukele? I mean, let's, well, I mean, I was going to say, let's put aside the mainstream stuff because it's asinine on every level on every topic. But I mean, just generally, what do you make of some of the more informed criticism of, of Bukele, let's say, the less well, hysterical? 
Well, let, let's divide that. So I, I think there's informed criticism, and I think there's uh, uninformed criticism, right? And I'll deal with the with the latter first. Um, I use a similar uh, heuristic uh, to analyzing the news that, that you do. If I hear the same exact thing from a whole lot of different outlets, uh, I tend to immediately be skeptical of it. And I can assure you that there is no world leader and there's no country like El Salvador that has received so much negative press <laughs> over the last couple of years since basically he announced his uh, uh, offensive against uh, the criminal cartel and uh, announcing the Bitcoin law. Uh, so much tremendous, overwhelming negative uh, press. Uh, it's just it's hard to um, uh, hard to go a day without seeing it. Now, I do think that there's informed criticism. I think that there is an opposition party here who wants to, to have serious conversations around human rights. I do think that there are uh, people that have uh, serious concerns about the speed with which we've done some of these things. And um, I think that those conversations are certainly appropriate to have. They're not appropriate for me to have, however. And I want to let you in on a little thing that not everybody knows, but foreigners in El Salvador are constitutionally prohibited from participating directly or indirectly in politics. It's very, very important. It's written into the Constitution for a reason. And if you violate that, you will be deported. So I'm not going to participate directly or indirectly in the political scene by giving you my opinions on the policies that are in place right now. I can just tell you that they seem to be enormously popular. That's an interesting thing to have in the Constitution, in the Constitution is it not? That you can't, I mean, directly, okay. But indirect, if you were to become a citizen, that would change, right? If you naturalized right. over the five years, that would change. But up until that point, indirectly involved, I mean, that, that seems fairly vague. It, presumably, it means because of your restriction here that you don't even want to comment on certain things. Is, is that what indirectly involved in politics means to you? That's how I, I uh, interpret it. I mean that uh, supporting a particular person uh, as a candidate for a particular office or even a, a political party, party broadly, uh, I would say that that's uh, indirectly supporting or, or influencing the political scene here. Uh, so I take a, a, a pretty strong read on that. But you also have to appreciate the, the history of Central America and why that particular phrase is in the Constitution, uh, because many Central American uh, nations have been at the wrong end of influence politics uh, for so long from their neighbors to the north. And so it's something that's uh, that people here rightly feel sensitive about. And, and I want to be um, uh, appreciative of their feelings and, and, and be very careful in, in my statements. All I can say is that I enjoy El Salvador. I think that things are going, broadly speaking, in the right direction. And the policies here seem to be very popular. Fair enough. Um, I wonder what that means for Max and Stacy, because they seem pretty <laughs> exuberant and positive on Bukele. So, you know, on that definition, it would seem that they're indirectly involved. But I'll I'll leave that one and and just comment on another point, which was, you know, you message you you mentioned how much of a kind of strategic genius Bukele is and how he's, you know, opened up fronts on many different, you know, opened up many different fronts, whether it be the economic, the monetary, the political, the social, all these sorts of things. And you mentioned rightly, you know, if anyone looks at the history of American involvement in Central and South America over the last hundred years, let's say, it's atrocious. I mean, it's just colonialism, imperialism, whatever you want to call it, but there's so much meddling in the affairs, both, you know, from um, from all angles, right? Whether the corporate angle, the three-letter agency angle, the official policy angle, coups, assassinations, all that kind of jazz. Um, are, are you fearful? I mean, I, I want to be careful how I word this, but are you fearful that the tenure of the existing government could be cut short by some external force becoming involved because they're unhappy with how the apple cart is being upset by all these moves and policies. I, I appreciate the kid gloves. I, I certainly do. But I will say that I get that question or variations of it from every single person that comes to see me. What happens if, right? Um, my response to that is, you know, so so what are you going to do? Are you going to live your life not doing what you think is right because of fear that, you know, some three-letter agency is going to 
want to to, to see you gone. Uh, I, I don't think that that's um, I don't think that's a sustainable uh, solution, right? At the end of the day, we have to choose what's important to us, and uh, we have to recognize that life is uh, life involves risk, right? And I would rather do the right thing at some degree of risk than um, than constantly do the wrong thing to to seek some sort of illusory safety. Uh, I don't think that that's a, a very real uh, question even to, to to answer. So I think that. Um, in response to that question, I'm not concerned about the impact that that would have in the country. Uh, so I talked a little bit about Nueva Sedeas. I'd like to expand on that uh, a little bit. So Nueva Sedeas is a political party, but within Nueva Sedeas, there's a, a, a group that uh, are referred to as the Bancada Cyan, the Cyan bench. And these are uh, people who are thoroughly orange-pilled, they are trained to fill different roles, different ministries in government. And I can assure you that there will be a continuity of this type of government for many years to come, even if individuals are no longer in place. Uh, and I mean that from, from all levels of government. Uh, so I'm, I'm not concerned about uh, the continuity of the policies like the Bitcoin law, for example, or, or our developments around Bitcoin City, which is really just a, um, a, a redevelopment and, and a, a economic development initiative for the eastern part of the country. That's something that is uh, so broadly popular that we know that that's going to happen. So I'm not concerned about the continuation of policies. Um, and, you know, all I can do is speak for myself, like even if I thought that my life was at, at danger because I was, you know, supporting Bitcoin or, you know, supporting El Salvador, uh, I still would choose to do that because I personally believe it's the right thing to do. And I don't think I'm alone in that in that uh, decision. Amen. Great response. Speaking of continuity and also some of the criticisms from external sources around Bukele um, is so he's planning on running again in 2024. And to do that, I think a constitutional change or amendment has to take place where a second term is permitted. Do you know if if that um, if they're adding the the ability to continue for a second term is what they're doing or adding just, you know, open ended as long as you are voted into office? You know what the changes are around that? So. I'm not the expert to speak to on this. You're going to want to reach out to Jaime Garcia. He's popular on Twitter, and he is the individual who uh, debated uh, Alex Gladstein on this uh, particular issue. Uh, he would give you the specifics, but here's how I understand it. Uh, the law uh, prevents uh, someone who is currently in office from running again, and what's going to happen is uh, at some point in the future, uh, President Bukele is actually going to uh, give up his uh, office uh, for some time, become a civilian, and then uh, apparently run again. I don't have any more specific details on that. Um, as far as I understand, that did not require any sort of amendment to the Constitution. It was a, okay. an interpretation of the Constitution by the Supreme Court, who basically were sought by the, uh, by the president or by the members of Nueva Sedeas, who went to the Supreme Court here and said, you know, here, here's what we are interested in doing, and uh, does this meet the constitutional requirements? The judges looked at it, they uh, uh, rendered their opinion on it, and that's the path forward that um, that President Bukele and uh, Nueva Sedeas are going to follow. But again, that's the extent of my knowledge. Uh, like I said, I try to focus more on just the rather mundane governmental affairs of getting people residency and, and setting up corporations. And uh, I don't have a lot of involvement uh, uh, or even knowledge of uh, other types of policies in uh, what's happening with the assembly. Although hopefully that'll change. Um, I do have uh, a partner that is interested in going and, and doing some English language reporting on what the actual government is, is doing on a day-to-day -day basis at the assembly. Uh, because uh, interestingly enough, El Salvador just passed a, a, a law that allows basically anybody who is a YouTuber to go in and have the same access to the halls of government that only credentialed uh, reporters have been able to have in the past. Wow. Uh, it's part of a broader push to sort of uh, make the uh, the halls of government more open uh, to anybody and everybody who wants to come and see. So if you're a YouTuber with a with a little camera and you want to go in there and film the the goings on of the assembly and they even set you up like a little press room, you've got a workstation, they give you coffee and donuts. I think it's uh, it's crazy. They're they're really being very accommodative 
uh, for people who want to come in and get a, a better understanding. And so I'm going to be working with a partner who is uh, going into uh, the assembly to report that, but to do it to the English speaking audience uh, so that we can have a, a better and more direct uh, line of understanding what's happening on a day to day basis. That's awesome. That's awesome. You know, I always in thinking about this, you know, when you have an extremely popular leader who seems and as and again, I'll caveat this by saying, to whatever degree you believe democratic form of government is legitimate, you know, right. like, so to whatever degree you're not an anarchist, and obviously there's a very interesting discussion to be had there, but if you support, you know, constitutional democracy or something like that, um, term limits always seem kind of weird to me because, you know, you'd think, well, if you're going to go by that style of government, why not, you know, if the citizenry, if the voting public wants to keep having the same person at the helm of that government, why not allow them to continue to do so? And, you know, perhaps part of the argument goes, well, yeah, but what if a strong man comes into power and fucks with stuff? It's like, yeah, but whenever that happens, they fuck with everything anyways. You know, they don't, they don't abide by, that's the whole reason why they're a strong man, because they don't abide by the, the constitutional protections and that kind of stuff. So that doesn't matter, you know? So why have, why have limits on the length of time someone who's democratically elected to, to lead you know, why have those limits in the first place? It seems somewhat irrational, illogical. Yeah, I think that um, there are a lot of different ways to handle governance. Um, I do happen to be what you would broadly call a federalist, I guess. Uh, I believe in having um, different uh, strong local jurisdictions and uh, I don't think that it's wrong to have them coordinated at a, at a federal level. Uh, and so I would be probably broadly Republican in the sort of original sense of the term. Um, as far as uh, term limits go, I can totally understand your, uh, your perspective. I think that what really needs to happen is, um, I think we need to talk about how we vote and the types of voting techniques that we use and the transparency around voting. I think that those are all issues that uh, that every country in the world needs to really address uh, these days because, you know, most countries are using a system that is so easy to manipulate and is uh, basically, let's let's face it, hundreds of years old. And um, I think it's time uh, for a little bit of update in the, the technology of voting. I think that would give a lot of people more uh, faith in the process and uh, feel that they have more uh, agency uh, and, and take more civic pride in what's happening in their own communities. And uh, that would be interesting to, to see. But again, that's uh, that's a bit above my pay grade. Sure. Well, I, I was listening to some of your other interview with uh, Mike Peterson a, a while mm -hmm. back. And you said that, I mean, th this these sort of topics seem to have been interesting of interest to you for a long time. I think in the 90s, you were working on something akin to like a free cities project in Costa Rica. Right. Um, and then you know, and you had lived in Eastern Europe. And when you heard the uh, Bitcoin announcement in 2021, you just thought that's got, and you were a Bitcoiner. And so like those ideas around freedom and liberty and all that kind of stuff were already, you know, very strongly and importantly held by you. And so when you saw someone plant that flag, you just thought, all right, let's go. You know, this is, this is kind of what we've been waiting for. Um, you've also brought up Bitcoin City a few times. What do you make of, you know, when you imagine a freer society, because there's always this tension between you need an authority, right. you need some kind of authority to set the rules which allows freedom to flourish, right? Or to uphold even the lack of rules. You know, you need that for freedom to flourish. But the danger and the reason why, you know, establishing the right checks and balances on, on governments is always difficult is because, well, if you have the authority to uphold a set of rules that are broadly, you know, liberty enhancing, then you also have the authority to do the opposite. Um, right. And so coming from the background, the ideological or philo philosophical background that you come from in, in being involved in those prior projects in the 90s, what do you make of the enterprise that is modern, you know, current El Salvador in terms of how you think this style of government, what it will produce in terms of a society, an economy, a market, and also would love to get your take on, uh, you know, manage your political commentary to whatever extent you you need to. But, you know, the, the idea of um, a, a Bitcoin city, for example, where the government, you know, you have a, a central planning city, you know, you have the government centrally planning a city, allocating the capital versus perhaps 
allowing more of a, a free market approach to that kind of stuff. What, what is your take on how sure. El Salvador today conforms with your, your prior notions of, of free cities and free life and the take on, you know, kind of building cities from the government, the government building cities rather. Okay, so that's a, <laughs> a very broad area that we laid out for, for my response here. Um, I'll try to do my best. Um, the first thing that I would say is that in response to sort of the ideological framing of my own personal beliefs and what I think everybody would uh, greatly benefit from, I, I can't encourage enough that you read the, the Federalist Papers. Uh, it, it's uh, some seminal works of, uh, uh, of thought uh, from the uh, founding fathers uh, in the United States. And uh, I think that they brought together some of the, the best ideas and put together a government in probably the best way that you could, given the restrictions uh, at the time. And one of the things that I find interesting is that you know, they chose to, to create, uh, you know, a mission statement uh, for what the government is supposed to do, right? To administer justice, right? You know, to, to promote the, the general welfare, right? Uh, to ensure domestic tranquility, right? There's six of them. Don't ask me to repeat them all. I don't have them memorized. But those key points, they defined as the reason why a government should exist, right? Uh, as opposed to no government at all. And uh, they resonate with me personally. Uh, obviously, someone has to administer justice in um, any environment. And if you don't have that, uh, well, you might as well have northern Mexico, for example. That would be a great uh, example of a completely uh, anarchist paradise, right? Um, I'm not going to move there anytime soon. Uh, so I do think that the administration of justice is, uh, is an appropriate uh, goal for a government to have. And that means that you have to have some type of structure around that, right? Um, in the project that I was um, uh, a part of in the 90s, uh, Laissez-Faire City, it was designed around the idea of being probably more like the free private cities uh, concept that we have floating around today. There was sort of a municipal corporation that was brought in to, uh, to create the structure of the government. And, um, you know, it was funding itself through municipal bonds, for example. Uh, so we're doing a very similar approach in Bitcoin City. And, and that's what immediately appealed to me is that I knew what we were trying to accomplish with Bitcoin City right away uh, because of my experience um, in, in Costa Rica. And I had been thinking for, for many, many years about how to solve these intractable problems uh, or seemingly intractable problems. And uh, I feel like I've got a good read on the situation. And um, Bitcoin City uh, being a centrally planned city, in my opinion, it makes a lot of sense. And I'm going to explain why. I totally understand uh, the ethos of a lot of Bitcoiners who immediately recoil at words like centralized. I totally understand that. However, we're talking about laying out and planning a city. Um, and, and, and I think that the fear response that, that we get from, from people in the community uh, really goes down to, well, if they can plan a grid for the streets, then they can make me, you know, wake up at seven and go to work uh, all day and then, you know, come home and like, Okay, so I, I get that, but but there's there's a, a disconnect between the amount of control that the government is uh, proposing to have over the city and what you may be imagining in your deep dark nightmares. Right, uh, this is not a 15 minute city in the way that it's being portrayed, um, you know, in, in, in the community. It's simply a city who has streets laid out intelligently with uh, public transport. We've got a light rail network that's planned for it, and and why would we want to do this? because it makes more sense to plan that type of infrastructure from the beginning when you have a blank slate than it does to try to wind in and, and, and deal with all of the types of things that happen with organic growth. But also it's important to remember that the planning of the city is really only the sort of central core of the city. Uh, it lays out the grid, it lays out the public transport, it broadly divides uh, uh, residential and commercial and entertainment zones in, in the city. And then from there, organic growth can happen at the edges and expand on to, to, to any degree. So it's not like anyone is saying organic growth can't happen, but I would also challenge the people who say that it has to be organic all the way from the beginning. I would say, okay, well, then explain to me why there isn't a city in this location right now, 
explain to me why we don't have Singapore already. Uh, if you can, if you can make a, a really good argument about why it hasn't organically popped up there, uh, then you know I'm going to have that conversation and I'll engage with you. But I think that it requires large amounts of resources to go in to do things like exploit the the energy resources of the Conchagua volcano. Obviously, it's uh, a, a geologic phenomenon where we can go in and get geothermal energy that it would be sufficient to power an entire city. Uh, but I would challenge anyone to say that uh, a completely free market approach would go and exploit that energy resource. I would just simply say, why haven't they already? Well, the reason is political will and raising a lot of money. It has to come together and it, and it, it takes a group to, to do these kinds of things. So that's my broad justification for why we're planning the city in the way that we're doing, uh, why you're going to need some sort of uh, government structure to, to perform the basic duties of government. And then I would just simply say, look at what has been promised and what has actually been accomplished. Because it's easy for us to, to write off grand promises. I understand that completely. I'm a don't trust verify kind of a guy. Uh, so if you want to get into the to the weeds about verification, look at what's happened over the last two years. What you have is so much proof of work around uh, what the administration and what the, uh, I, I guess, the people in the country, generally speaking, want to accomplish. Uh, we, we were showing the, 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 the fruits of our labor already. Uh, so if you have any doubts about that, I would just simply invite you to come and see it with your own eyes. You're going to be surprised because you probably have a lot of preconceived notions about what life in El Salvador is like. But when you finally get here and meet the people that are making this their home already, uh, I think you're going to become a believer. Yeah. And I want to, we'll break into that a little bit more on that in one second, but what is, I'm sure you get asked this all the time, but what is the, I think you tweeted about it maybe even today, some FUD that may have been going around, but what is the status of, of Bitcoin city? You know, I know the government said a lot on their plate, higher priority items, that kind of stuff, but you know, is there any sort of timeline expectation for when things may be being built, people can start relocating there, investing, all that kind of stuff? Absolutely. So I'm, I'm going to refrain from giving timelines because it's difficult to, to be held down to, to specific milestones, but I'm going to tell you what needs to happen uh, logically in order for this to happen. Understand that really big businesses and countries they have to finance their operations in ways that are different than we as individuals finance our operations. Um, these larger entities have to do debt financing. They issue a large amount of debt on a regular basis. They bring in money from, from that debt offering. They use that money to fund their operations and pay back previous debts. It's just how the world of business works, right? You understand this, I understand this. Um, but we have a challenge with El Salvador specifically, because we've chosen, in my opinion, the hero's journey, and we've given the big middle finger to the IMF, to the World Bank, to the big banks around the world, to the traditional legacy financial system, and we've said that that is not the path forward for us. We have to choose a different path. And that sounds great on paper. But where the rubber hits the road, you still have to finance the operations of the country in a way that makes sense. And that's why we have the volcano bonds. We have to be able to take advantage of the newer technology that's available to us today, the technology built around Bitcoin. So we have second layer networks like the liquid network where we can issue assets that represent this debt offering. We can issue those assets, we can sell them frictionlessly to anyone around the world who wants to participate through a provider like Bitfinex. We have to make sure the volcano bonds are successful. If they aren't successful, then not only is Bitcoin City a pipe dream, but the entire idea of a sovereign nation adopting Bitcoin and being able to forge a new financial path, uh, that's a pipe dream too. Everything comes down to the volcano bonds. It is the linchpin of the entire operation. So why hasn't Bitcoin City developed yet? It's because we haven't been able to roll out the volcano bonds yet. However, they're coming very soon. We've had to fight a war. I don't know if you guys noticed, but uh, we've been fighting a war for the last 12 months. And, and I like to 
explain to as many people as I can the size and the scope of this war. I went into this a little bit on the One Galt podcast that I did uh, a couple of weeks ago, but basically I want to draw some comparisons between El Salvador and Afghanistan. Similar in many ways, uh, similar amounts of total population and similar amounts uh, or percentages of the population involved in the criminal enterprise, right? We had as much as 1% of our total population involved in the gangs and uh, the, the criminal cartels, right? So we fought an Afghanistan-sized war. They had about 1% of their population in Al-Qaeda and the, the sort of the related uh, terrorist uh, uh, groups uh, around that. We fought an Afghanistan-sized war in a couple of months Whereas in Afghanistan, it took over 20 years, cost trillions of dollars. Uh, you lost uh, many, many millions of lives. Uh, it was a national uh, and, and, and international disgrace. And they lost. They lost the Afghanistan war. We won an Afghanistan-sized war in only a couple of months. We did it with only losing a few lives of our uh, brave police officers and, and military personnel. Uh, we did it not only without the support of a Western coalition, but despite their active opposition and meddling in our situation. That is uh, a, an accomplishment for the ages, if you ask me. Uh, and why did this happen? Why did this uh, war come to a head at that exact moment? I don't know if you remember, but there was a, a time when um, uh, CZ uh, from Binance came down to, to visit El Salvador. He was touring uh, the Hope House. He was down in Zonte. Uh, he was looking at expanding Binance operations uh, uh, in El Salvador. They've already hired a, a handful of Salvadorans. I'm not exactly sure what they're doing, but whatever. He's got jobs going, so that's great. Um, but he was down here, and that weekend, uh, the gang members, the criminal cartel in El Salvador, received orders, most likely from the United States, there are receipts, uh, to create a weekend of terror. So they went out and they indiscriminately killed many dozens of people and just left the bodies in the road, shot them while they were in their car. It was an absolutely horrific scene that gripped the nation and it caused us to accelerate our plans for the uh, national uh, control plan, uh, our territorial control plan, which is basically the war against uh, the criminal cartel. That had to come first because we can't just let innocent people be slaughtered uh, by these criminals uh, at, at, at will. So we did that first. We've wrapped that up. And like I said, it's not mission accomplished. We're, we're still doing operations, but for the most part, you can see in the numbers the uh, incredible success that we've had. And now we've been able to turn our focus to reforming the, the, the digital wall. Right, so we've passed uh, several laws in the last couple of months uh, around digital assets and their issuance. We've got commissions that are being formed uh, to create rules on on how exactly we're going to manage the companies that want to come here and issue their equity in the form of tokens. So we've got all of that that has been done and is and continuing to be done. And now we have the stage set. Bitfinex has been licensed to uh, be a digital asset service provider in El Salvador and. Uh, the iron is hot and we're ready to strike. So we're about to release the volcano bonds. Hopefully that happens and it subscribes very quickly and that there's a lot of demand. And then we will have proven to the world that we can finance our operations without the active support of the legacy financial system, without the parasitic loans that the IMF would force on us that would keep us uh, a second class uh, citizens of the world. We don't wanna be second class citizens. We wanna be on equal, ground with the other other sovereign nations of the world, a sovereign among sovereigns. But in order to do that, we have to control our money. That's a, that's a familiar sound, right? Because that's something that all Bitcoiners believe in. If you want to control your freedom, you got to control your money. And that's what we're dealing with right now. So that's the linchpin. We do the volcano bonds. Everything else comes as a result. Are the Will the volcano bonds, I mean, can you purchase... Will you be able to purchase them with fiat or is that a Bitcoin only? You'll, you'll be able to purchase them with uh, U.S. dollars and with Bitcoin and with Tether, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I know timelines are tough, but you said they're very close. I mean, are you aware of what the holdup is or is this something that will happen this year? Or? June and September. Say that again. The rumors I'm hearing are that we will issue the bonds sometime between June and September. So we're 
only weeks away at this point. And in your opinion, if they go well, then we're off to the races with things. That's basically the, the, the point. If we can prove to the world that we can manage our finances and that we can uh, issue debt and, and be supported by you know uh, the debt holders around the world who believe in the Salvadoran mission, then everything else is, um, in my opinion, easy to accomplish. The plans are in place. We've got the skills. We need more brains. Don't get me wrong. So if you're out there and you've got a big brain on your shoulders, uh, come to El Salvador and help us out. We need all of the help we can get. But we've got all of that other stuff in play. Now we need the financing. The financing comes. And like you said, we're off to the races. Um, before I then make the next or delve into the next thing, I noticed throughout this conversation, you use we and our a lot. You know, as so as to indicate that you've kind of adopted a Salvadoran identity. Indeed. Is that true? And in, if so, when when did that change happen in your mind? When did you start identifying as a Salvadoran? You know, someone who's. <clears throat> I mean, know. obviously, it's a it's a journey, right? Um, adopting any culture is a journey. Uh, there are things that I do well. There are things that I don't do well. Everybody's a little bit different. Um, my Spanish is coming along, but it's still not at the, the, the high end of the conversational level that I would like it. Uh, I have a bit of a crutch because I have a big team around me, and they're the ones that actually interface with the public the most. And so I don't get as many practice days in as, as I should, but I'm still learning. Me both. Yeah. So, um, so, so it, it's a process. And for me, uh, because I come originally from the States, it's a five-year process. I have to go through the, the time. I have to put in the time of being a temporary resident, becoming a permanent resident, and then I can naturalize and become a true Salvadoran. But as far as me uh, making that decision in my own mind, where I want to live, where I'm going to continue to keep my family, uh, it's absolutely El Salvador. And I haven't second-guessed that uh, decision at all. One of the things that is so fascinating and obvious as far as i'm concerned about bitcoin is that you know and i make this point all the time but there are certain there's a certain ethic built into bitcoin right like you know let's just say it fairness right everyone's subject to the same rules we, we don't even have to get into all the other ones truth is another one let's say um and because when that's made apparent to people when people observe that to the extent that they value that ethic they're drawn to it like anything you know like oh I like that. I agree with that. I want more of that. I want to invite that into my life. I want to participate in that in some way. And so Bitcoin is this massive attractor for what I, what I think are extremely valuable ethics or principles or morals or however you'd like to characterize them. And it's pulling all these people in, right? So yet, you know, as the saying often goes, you come for a number, go up, you stay for the revolution. Well, the revolution is is an ethical revolution, really. I mean, it's offering the same rights and rules to everyone around the world, regardless of your stature or your race, your ethnicity, your background, anything. Um, and it seems to me to be the case that a microcosm of that is happening in El Salvador right now, because as we said at the outset, they've planted a flag. Now it's a less trust trustworthy flag, in my opinion, than the one offered in Bitcoin, because it's still, you know, laws of men, let's say, and not as, not as permanent as, as, you know, what we know Bitcoin to be, but nevertheless, it, it, as time goes on, it's proving to be relatively genuine and I relative to the promises made by other jurisdictions all around the world. And what seems to be happening uh, is that it's drawing in people that similarly value those principles that are being signaled by that jurisdiction. And they're the first that are making the leap. You're obviously an, a, an example of this. And many who I, I presume you work with are saying, I value those things, those freedoms, those liberties, those approaches to things. So I'm going to go there. And obviously what that's going to create is just more and more of those types of people that, that are principled people, that are you know uh, imaginative people, ambitious, hopeful, driven, ethical, all into one place. And I've been, so I've been there three times now. And the first two times were mostly in Zante. And then the last time was mostly in San Salvador. And uh, that was the impression I got. Mostly, you know, from a lot of the foreigners that I'd met that were either visiting or, or, had, or are living there, you know, at least the interest is like, that's why so many people are interested. And then as you, I've heard you talk about, and anyone who's, who's been to El Salvador lately will say the same thing. You talk to locals and they're, you know, infused with this enthusiasm over the you know the changes over the last you know three four five years 
And so they're hopeful, they're optimistic, they're ambitious, they're helpful, they're polite, they're respectful, they're welcoming, all those things that you'd want to see. I mean, I've done a lot of traveling around and especially in Latin America. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's absolutely awesome people everywhere, but many places you feel a bit like an outsider. You feel a bit like a gringo. There's a bit of an edge. Some, you know, a lot of a lot of places will think, hey, you know, what are you doing here? You're taking something from me in some way. You know, there's that that kind of a vibe in a lot of places. My 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 experience in, in San Salvador was the opposite. You know, people were just welcoming, like, Hey, welcome, you know, like, come on in. We're everyone just, there's a really good vibe going on there right now. And uh, so, you know, I'd love for you to comment on that. You did a little bit already, but just what, what do you think is, is happening here? What do you, how do you expect that to develop, you know, as, as the years push forward? Absolutely. So let's, Let's analyze the situation <clears throat> by looking at the polar opposite, right? So you go to a place like um, Canada, the United States, uh, some Western European countries, uh, especially the United Kingdom, um, you can see how they're in a vicious cycle uh, where everyone is uh, very pessimistic and you, no one feels like they can trust the government. I would challenge you to find anybody in those countries that think that they could actually affect change uh, through the political process anymore. Everybody has given up because there are so many other indicators that you should give up that it's a vicious cycle. It's a downward spiral. We know that it's collapsing. But the same type of feedback loop can happen in the other way. You can have a virtuous cycle. And that's what we're experiencing in El Salvador. When you are not alone in your optimism, but when every time you meet somebody out on the street that they're also optimistic, that just gives you more life force. That gives you more uh, energy and enthusiasm for the future. And it, it, everything builds on each other, right? You feel a little bit better about investing in, in, in this property or, or opening this new business because your vision for the future is brighter. But why did that happen? That happened primarily because of the safety issue. So we have to, to, to give credit where it is due. The government has solved the safety problem by administering justice for the first time in many, many years, right? Second, and I think equally important to that, is the Bitcoin law. Uh, this is something that, um, you know, the cypherpunk uh, philosophy from, from years ago uh, spoke about. You know, we, we have to solve problems in cyberspace, but there's also this important part where we have to recognize that we live in meat space and we have to solve some of those problems too. You don't always find solutions uh, for one and the other, uh, but they have to be developed in tandem. Uh, so we've solved, for the most part, in my opinion, uh, the piece around money. Uh, we still have some work to do around uh, privacy uh, uh, in terms of our uh, uh, financial experience uh, online and, and, and in the world of Bitcoin. But we're pretty good at it right now, in my opinion. But we now have to, to fix the meat space problem of, you know, where are you going to live? And uh, one of the, the major concerns that anyone would have is safety. It's just like you go out and buy a car. You're not going to buy a car without an airbag. Safety is the number one concern that, that the average person has when they go out and buy a car. Well, it's uh, equally very high when you choose a place to live, right? No one wants to live in a dangerous place. So that's a critical first step. That's what we've been able to do here. Now, we do have challenges. I don't want to paint too rosy of a picture because we'll get a lot of people that'll buy that plane ticket and show up and think that this is, you know, Paris. It's not. Uh, we, we have some work to do. But if you're the type that wants to roll up your sleeves and actually do something, well, there's a great opportunity for you here in El Salvador because we just need everything. So that's a wonderful opportunity for just about anyone because you can just throw a dart at the board and find a business idea. And as long as you pursue it with some degree of passion and intelligence, you're going to be successful, right? And the barriers to entry are so extraordinarily low. I remember being back in the United States. I've always had this uh, passion and this vision around eventually opening a restaurant. But as the years went by in the United States, that dream became out of reach uh, for me because uh, you know if you if you're not willing to to throw down a million dollars to to set up that operation, like you're just not going to to make any progress with with the things that you have to do and the regulations that you have to to deal with. But here, those barriers don't exist. So uh, capital is an important part, but certainly not the most important concern for you to have. 
your elbow grease, your sweat equity is going to go so much further in El Salvador. And I think that's what makes it a very interesting place for a lot of do-it-yourselfers, a lot of the Bitcoin types that want to actually, you know, get their hands dirty and and, and build something. Uh, this is a perfect place to come and do it. You know, one of the things that, um, the one of the feelings I really like when I'm there, and I noticed a stark contrast when I return to where I am now, um, or anywhere really, is, and you know, again, we're we're really being fanboys here, but it is the case that when I'm when I'm in El Salvador, and you know, there's people accept Bitcoin in lots of places, you know, perhaps not as prevalent as is sometimes, uh, you know, promised or, or said, but you know, you can you can spend it a lot of places. There's there's ATMs all over the place. I even paid my entry tax ticket or whatever with Bitcoin last time I was there, and just for, because of that alone, I mean. Also, all the optimism and hope and the, the sensible policies elsewhere contribute to this. But to me, it just feels like a place that makes more sense. You know, if you kind of look out on the world today and you see clown world everywhere, you're like, oh, my God, like this just this makes absolutely no sense. This policy, this speech, this politician, this whatever. Th if you're trying to make the world a better place, if you're trying to promote human flourishing, these th none of this makes sense. The shutting down the energy resources like it's just it's all upside down. And one of the the feelings I got when I was there, I was like, ah, oh, like this is this, you know, as you said, lots of problems, lots of work to be done, just the beginning of the story. But there's like a, there's an underwriting current or vibe of like, oh, this, like th things make sense here. There's more rationale here. And I like that because rationale is what helps you fit the world together. And once you can fit the world together, you can figure out how you want to move through it. And uh, when I get back to anywhere, whenever I leave and I wind up where I'm, where I do, I'm like, oh, this place feels dumber. There's less rationality, you know, built into my experience of of any other place. And you know that that's an extremely compelling thing. I think, as you say, for, especially for a lot of Bitcoiners, because we're, you know, we we uh, are above average probably calling out and observing the the clown worldly, the inverse sort of rationale that pervades in the world today. So, I mean, presumably you you have a similar you know, observation or feeling, right? Yeah, and, and it's not just the sort of institutional culture. Like I, I feel what you've felt, uh, you know, in a lot of different countries. And, and I think that it's it, it has to do with the culture of, of institutions and government, and it really just sort of pervades society. And it can make it feel oppressive or it can make it feel free. Uh, here it feels free. And it's not just that you have the liberty to do things. Uh, it's that we're not afraid to reach for really ambitious goals and see them actually succeed. For example, we just recently signed an agreement where we're going to bring in thorium nuclear reactors into El Salvador. We're going to be a nuclear country. Uh, I'm not going to say when, but I'm <laughs> going to tell you that you're going to be surprised when you when you hear about it. Um, but that's uh, such a, a lofty goal that so many other countries that you you might be in and you would say, there's no way we're going to get it done. You know, there's there's too many vested interests. There's there's too many regulations or whatever. But we did it. It took a long time to push it through. Uh, but the gentleman that was working behind the scenes to make it happen made it happen. And we're going to be on nuclear power uh, sooner rather than later. And it's going to bring our cost of energy uh, down to. Uh, I'm not going to give you uh, the number. I'm just going to say if you're a Bitcoin miner, you might be packing your bags right about now. <laughs> All right. Well, before I want to get into practicalities, but before we do that, you know, to uh, to balance things out a little bit here, I mean, what are some of the issues that exist down there or that persist down there that you know still have a long way to go and haven't been, you know, haven't been addressed yet by anyone? So they 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 still remain problems. Like, what what is it that annoys you down there that you'd really love to see get more attention and get resolved? Poverty. Uh, that's the number one thing, right? Like, l listen, we, we have people in El Salvador that are subsisting is probably the appropriate word on, uh, you know, you've, you've got a minimum wage here that's technically 365 US dollars per month. Uh, and many people are in the informal economy and not even making close to that. That has to stop. We have to fix that problem very, very quickly. And it's part of 
the, the broader push to revitalize the eastern part of the country. So if you imagine El Salvador, broadly speaking, is not having, uh, you know, the same standard of living as other um, nations, uh, maybe even in the area, well, it's doubly true for the eastern part of the, the country. And that's why it's really important that we restart the economic engine uh, on, the, on the eastern side of the Rio Limpa River. Uh, that is why Bitcoin City is designed to be installed uh, in the Far East, uh, near La Union and between La Union and the Conchagua volcano. Uh, so along the, the Gulf of Fonseca, uh, we need to restart the economic engine of the eastern part of the country so that we can raise everyone's standard of living and get them out of uh, some of the worst poverty that, that you can see um, in this hemisphere. Uh, so that's definitely uh, job number one. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Anything else in terms of well, anything else? The yeah, strikes, I mean, you know, it's, comes to it's, mind? it's the same thing that you would say going into any other country, right? Like what, what's the first thing that you need to fix? You need to fix the safety. Okay. You fix the safety. Okay. Now we need, you know, people's uh, standard of living to rise. And then you're going to start digging into the types of infrastructure that you expect in a, in a developed uh, country, right? Uh, we have, and we're doing good jobs in many different areas but there are significant gaps that we have to address. Uh, there are too many to really just sort of give you a laundry list, but what I can tell you is that if you're the entrepreneurial type and you have a broad-based skill set and you wanna come in and identify opportunities and serve that niche, uh, you can do so very easily here. No one is going to stand in your way. The ease of doing business in El Salvador is, is absolutely fantastic. And like I said, that's one half of our total solution here. So I'm happy to answer any questions people have about creating business structures and, and what they what the right steps are to, to, to get active in business here. Uh, certainly happy to, uh, to provide those answers. You know, just back to that prior point, um, I'm of the opinion, economically speaking, that minimum wage is actually deleterious to a you know, a thriving economy. You know, I think you want, like all things, to find the balance between supply and demand and maximize for productivity and employment and all that kind of stuff. Now, I know that's, you know, counter to the prevailing economic dogma in the world today, but I wonder if Bukele is popular enough and, in my view, sensible enough to pursue a policy like that for his knowledge that it would be more beneficial than imposing artificial pricing on labor. Right. So uh, I, I do think that we we have really big problems that we need to solve in terms of uh, government policy. Um, I believe that that prior to talking about something like labor laws, uh, we should really focus on taxation and how the government is funded, because I think that uh, the statement that you hear in the Bitcoin community is fix the money, fix the world, right? Uh, well, I think that's equally true in, in, in government, and we need to make sure that the incentives for government uh, are tied with the success of the people. And that's what we're attempting to do with the model that we're, we're, we're suggesting for Bitcoin City, right? Uh, no tax on income, no tax on property. OK, no municipal fees. OK, uh, basically, the tax that will fund this uh, government, at least in the uh, special economic zone of Bitcoin City, and I personally believe it'll be a model for the rest of the country, is a consumption tax. So if your population is consuming more, you as the government are making more money. Your incentives are now aligned with the incentives of the population. I think that's a really strong way to go. I will be the first to admit that technically I'm a Georgist and I would like to see uh, a, a, a probably a different approach uh, and that may not be as uh, popular in the Bitcoin community, but I am willing to compromise on that point because I believe that even so that I would choose a different uh, tax structure, I'm happy to accept a consumption-based tax for funding the government. I think that it's a fair compromise that a lot of people can agree on and it makes sense. Like I said, you know, as a Bitcoiner, and I certainly uh, have felt this for a long time, that incentives rule the game. And, and if we give evil incentives to a government, like, for example, uh, we, we, we want to tax on, on, on wealth or we want to tax on, you know, uh, uh, inheritance and, and, and all these things, then, then the government is going to optimize <laughs> for, for those types of activities, right? Mm. It's just, it's just a, a natural response, an organizational response to incentives. Uh, so we have to fix those things first. 
do I uh, agree that uh, down the line, looking into the particular issues around uh, labor law, for example, and minimum wage are important? Yes, but I do think that there are more important things that we should tackle first. And in the meantime, and while we're transitioning, I think it's very important that we should consider the needs and uh, the benefits and the livelihoods of the less fortunate in our country. Uh, they're very, very important uh, to the entire success of uh, what we're doing in El Salvador. And uh, I think it's important that we uh, make sure that they have good pensions so that they can live with dignity when they retire and they can't work anymore. I think that they should have good wages. And I hope that the free market responds and raises wages, but in some circumstances, we may have to push a little bit. But for right now, tackling the issue of taxation and how we fund the government, I think, is the lowest hanging fruit for us to, to focus on. And remember that, that this isn't a sprint. This is a journey. You know, uh, a constitution is a living document. A country is a thing that needs constant maintenance. And so we're going to be fixing this thing as we go along for the rest of our lives. It just so happens that El Salvador I think, is further ahead of the pack than anyone else because we're already accumulating our Bitcoin reserves. We've uh, shifted the technological focus around our, our business environment and our government environment to a thorough Bitcoin standard. Uh, those are the kinds of things that set us apart from the world, and they're the things that make me optimistic right now. Just out of curiosity, what's a Georgist and what is your preferred approaches, <clears throat> approach to taxation? Okay, so I'll tell you a little, um, uh, a little analogy here. Um, there was this king, uh, as the legend goes, uh, a, a Danish king, and uh, he had a little kingdom, and there was a big bay, and ships would come in from all over the world uh, to dock and uh, to trade, and he wanted to collect taxes on the, the ships that were coming in. And so he didn't want to, to have to do a lot of work to collect his taxes. He wanted to to be a little smart about it and uh, put the the sort of the burden for enforcement on on the uh, the individual and 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 not him as uh, creating like a big tax authority. So what he did is this: he said, "You can declare what your value of your ship is, and that's what you're going to pay your taxes on. But I, as the king, reserve the right to buy your ship at the rate that you declare it's worth." Uh, and you can't really say anything about it. Uh, so what this does is it, it puts the, uh, the the dilemma in the hand of the, the captain. They say, okay, I could choose to cheat and uh, say that my ship is, uh, my cargo and my ship is worth very little and therefore pay very little taxes, but I run the risk of the state buying the, the, the ship. Uh, so you can see in this, in this way that there is an equilibrium that is reached between the merchant and uh, the tax authority, whereby everybody is sort of agreeing on what they would accept and, and it's okay, right? Like uh, it, it's, a, it's more of a meeting of the minds than any other type of, of tax arrangement. And so a Georgist would typically take that type of approach, but apply it to land value. So if you had actual real estate in your name, you would pay a property tax on it, but it would be a sort of self-reported tax. You would say, I think that my land is worth this, but you have to be able to sell it at that level. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to explain Georgism uh, without getting uh, fairly technical fairly quickly, but that's my best explainer in uh, 60 seconds. <laughs> Fair enough. And so you think that would be in favor, like instead of a VAT, just a simple flat VAT tax and nobody else has to worry about anything, you know, you just tax at the point of consumption. You think that would be what more lucrative to the authority, the state, more more lucrative to the people? Like why the preference for, for something like that? So I, I think that my personal preference is there because I believe that Taxation should be somewhat progressive. And the argument against a flat tax is that it's regressive to, to an extent, but I'm going to say that they're very close, right? Like I said, it's it's a point that I'm willing to compromise on. And, and that's what civilization is all about, right? You don't get every single thing that you want to have happen if you want to live in a society that's civilized with rules, right? You're going to have to compromise. That's what the social contract is all about. And I'm telling you that I'm willing to uh, uh, to compromise on, on this particular issue. I think that uh, consumption tax and land value tax are very close. They are certainly leagues better than the other types of uh, taxes that you see in most countries around the world. Uh, so I would prefer either of those two. 
Okay, so short answer, you just think the 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 Georgia's approach is a little bit fairer, let's say. I think so. I I, I think that it does uh, give a little bit more responsibility for the taxation to to people that have greater means. Uh, but I do also understand why that's uh, uh, something that isn't as popular in the in the Bitcoin uh, circuit as well. Right. Right. All right. Well, let's get down to um, practicalities here. So, as it stands today in the country of El Salvador. You know, for all these people that are are moving there, who prospectively, you know, may move there, what what you know, what's the tax situation? How do they get temporary and then permanent residency? We've talked a little bit about naturalizing after five years of permanent residency. Does that change if you have children in the country? And I'll preface all this by saying this is relevant to me too, because I'm certainly considering, you know, what's going on in El Salvador. So um, let's start with taxation currently today, not in the special economic zone of, of Bitcoin City, but what's taxation in today for uh, people that are moving to El Salvador? Yeah, so there's there's a very lengthy and, and somewhat complicated structure that is our legacy tax system. It's not too terrible. It taps out at 30% uh, for the highest income earners, uh, but that tax applies to income that you derive inside the country. Uh, El Salvador, as some of you know, is a territorial taxation system, but it's what I like to call a true territorial taxation system. Uh, a lot of people compare it to Panama, but it's it's different. In Panama, your income can still be clawed uh, in certain ways uh, if you're a contractor and you're providing service uh, overseas. But here, the, the thing that matters uh, to determine whether or not income is um, uh, captured by the government is its origin. If it's foreign in nature, it doesn't have any tax liability. So that makes El Salvador an extraordinarily good choice for digital nomads, for example. If you have the ability to earn your income from uh, anywhere in the world, uh, then you can come here and you don't have to pay any taxes on income. There are other types of taxes that can apply to you. Um, for example, we have capital gains tax, but it's only 5%, all right? So if you have uh, dividend disbursements from companies that you own uh, in the country, again, like we're not talking about foreign sources of income, uh, but in the country, uh, you have those. But on our website, uh, escape2elsalvador.org, I have a blog post called Taxes in El Salvador, and it goes through and it lists all the different elements that you need to, to consider. Uh, but basically, to boil it down for most of your listeners, if you have the ability to do remote work and your income is from outside, you're not paying any taxes, and you're going to want to do that anyway. Let, let, let me just make that point very clear right here, because I get this question a lot. A lot of folks are ringing me up and saying, okay, I want to come to El Salvador, and then they say, well, how do I get a job? And I'm going to tell you right now, you don't want to do that uh, because the wages are very low, right? If you're competing with someone that is willing to, to crank out $365 a month, um, you're going to have a tough time in the labor market in most cases. Even professionals, uh, people here that have credentialed uh, work uh, licensing, let's say you're a nurse or an engineer or an attorney or whatever, you're talking like, you know, $600, $800, a $1,000 a month tops, right? Uh, that's the labor market. So if you have to support yourself based on one income, you're not going to be happy uh, uh, with, with, with the situation that you have. You're not going to live up to the, to the standards that you maybe have experienced in other developed countries. Uh, understand that the people here who are earning that, they're part of large family units and they have multiple incomes that, that support them. Uh, so just because the uh, minimum wage is low, that doesn't mean that you can live in an apartment by yourself on a minimum wage salary. That's not uh, the reality here. So make sure that you secure your remote foreign work before you come. That's my number one recommendation if you're considering moving. But you ask a lot of questions about residency too. Uh, I'm going to throw it back at you uh, so that we can get a specific one because I yep. can't remember exactly. What yeah, that's fine. So um, digital nomads, you know, foreign source income and entrepreneurs, you know, have at it. But if you're looking to work for a local company, then, you know, possibly not the greatest idea at the present time. I mean, treat it like a charitable event. Right. You know, that's the only way to do it. Um, what is the you know, becoming a temporary and then permanent resident process like in terms of time and costliness? 
Yeah, so uh, we can do it relatively quickly if you bring the right documents. Obviously, everybody needs a passport. The passport needs to have plenty of time on it. And then everybody, if you're an adult, you have to have a criminal record check. And if you're a child, you have to have a birth certificate. Now, down the road, everybody has to have a birth certificate if you want to become a citizen. But for residency, it's not required. So adults, criminal record check, children, birth certificates, and both of these documents have to be legalized. And that means that they have a stamp on them that they're either authenticated from their home government or apostilled from their home government. That's a special type of usually an adhesive stamp that goes on a document. It indicates to a different country that the document is actually legitimate. So you've got to bring those basic things and then you have to qualify for a particular program. Uh, so we have residency programs in a lot of different areas, right? Uh, just like what you may experience uh, elsewhere. You think about people going to study in the United States or going to study in Germany or whatever. Well, we have student visas too. You can come and study in El Salvador. You can get accepted by a Salvadoran university pretty easily. You submit your document there. But then when you apply for your visa, you're going to have to show documents that makes sense there. So you're probably going to need your, your diploma, right? Your student records, right? Your letter of acceptance from that institution. Those are all going to have to be uh, legalized as well. So if you're going the student route, the documents that you have to provide are relevant to that visa program. And the same thing is true if you're a missionary. So if you come uh, with a church uh, group or even just as yourself uh, to do the, the, the Lord's work or what have you, you're going to need documents from your church that detail what it is that you're trying to do and how you're going to support yourself. Uh, but the easiest way, in my personal opinion, and our most popular visa option is the digital nomad visa, because there's some really great points here. You don't have to prove your income and you don't have to make an investment. So there's a lot of misconception around, oh my gosh, I need to, to bring three Bitcoin and, and buy some property in the, in the country. That is not the case, all right? So that that's um, that goes back to a, a statement that's very old and it's been changed. So there's no investment that's required. However, this is going to change slightly when the volcano bonds issue because the volcano bonds are going to become an additional pathway to ultimately getting citizenship and they are gonna require the investment uh, at that rate. But for the traditional sort of uh, existing residency programs, there are many different ones and many different ways to apply, and several of them require no investment at all. So let's say you're digital nomad, you fit the, the mold that we've been discussing, you want to get your temporary and then with plans on permanent later, um, what, is, what are the administrative costs to do it or your pricing or like how, how much is someone going to spend on getting through this process and getting set up in the country and to stop having to worry about the bureaucratic <laughs> nonsense? An individual is probably needs to, to um, expect around $2,500 worth of uh, legal expenses in order to get residency. A family uh, can be 4,000 and up, uh, depending on the agency that you go to. We actually recently uh, instituted a policy where all kids are free. It doesn't matter how many kids you have. Right? I passed this, uh, this 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 little deal, and I had a lady reach out to me with eight kids, uh, but that's okay. We're going to take care of all eight <laughs> of those uh, little rugrats, uh, absolutely free of charge. So the only people that are paying uh, for the residency process are adults. And so if it's a single person, it's 2500 If it's a couple, it's less than $4,000 uh, for that amount. And one thing that's interesting about El Salvador, when we're talking about the family structure, is that you can actually bring other family members with you in a very permissive way. You can go up to the fourth degree of consanguinity, which means relation by blood, or up to the second degree of affinity, which means uh, legal relationships, right? So you can literally have a, a great nephew uh, come with you as a, as a family member, as long as you have some document that proves the blood relationship. Uh, and you can bring uh, parents-in-law or uh, uh, children-in-law as well with you, because that's uh, uh, the degree of, of legal relationship as well. So uh, it's very permissive in terms of the family group that you can bring. Um, and then, you know, obviously your, your fees at that point are going to be per adult. When you say bring with you, what do you, mm -hmm. what, what does that mean? Well, they, they, they get attached to your visa. 
right? So if you come as a uh, as a digital nomad, for example, and you have a decent income, you can financially support multiple people in your family uh, by simply declaring that you are, you know, responsible for them. At this point, the immigration office is going to look and say, okay, maybe you should show us uh, a bank statement. Maybe you should show us some some proof that you have the money to actually support these people. Uh, it isn't uh, a specific thing that's required. It's basically a common sense test. If you can uh, show to the uh, immigration officer that you have the financial wherewithal to support, you know, five people in your family, they're going to give you the ability to bring all of them in under your visa. Okay, that that's interesting. So let me let me give you an, a, a specific example in my case. Sure. So my uh, fiance is, yes. you know, and let's just say wife in the future is has a Thai passport only. Thank you. Um, if I was, you know, and, and they, they don't have visa free entry into El Salvador, you know, they would have to go through whatever process to get a visa, which is pain in the ass in itself. But are you saying that if I had temporary residence in El Salvador, that she wouldn't need a, a standard visitor visa to enter the country? Like she would be, she would be able so, to get in through me? Uh, hit, hit me one more time. What was her nationality? Thai. Hi. Yes. So, um, yeah. So she needs a consular visa in order to get into the country first. Obviously, you're already aware of that. Uh, just requires an invitation uh, from someone. Uh, you could do it yourself, uh, basically. And by the fact that you are going to be married, that's uh, justification as well. Um, but yes, she would apply as a companion to you. So your visa application would be for the entrepreneur, digital nomad, you know, content creator, whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. And she would file a companion visa. It's our F9. And they go together uh, to immigration. Uh, and as long as you basically sign a financial statement saying that you can support her, uh, then she can go uh, and qualify under you. But she could also qualify for herself independently as well, even being from a, a non-visa on arrival country. Uh, she would just have to fit one of the, the different descriptions. Maybe she's also uh, an entrepreneur or a digital nomad, or maybe she wants to study or whatever. Like she can qualify independently, but she can also qualify as your companion. Right. Um, and as far as getting in, getting that visitor visa, because for some places and jurisdictions, it's hard when you have certain types of passports, Thai being, uh, Thailand being one of them. Um, is it difficult to do that in El Salvador? Do your experience like people from non visa on arrival countries trying to get visas? Do they have to provide like every fucking piece of information they have, or is it relatively reasonable? Well, so I mean, that's all relative. Uh, what is reasonable? <laughs> uh, I'm I'm going to say that it's it's obviously possible, uh, right? You're going to have to do some work. Uh, usually, okay, put yourself in the in the the shoes of the immigration officer, right? Understand that their mandate is you know, a couple of different things, but one of them is keeping out the bad guys, right? And so if, if someone is uh, wanting to come in from this uh, non-visa on arrival con uh, uh, contract on this visa, uh, they have to have some kind of relationship with a person in the country that's inviting them to come there. They can't just show up because they want to, right? So when you say that you're inviting that person over, what you're going to have to do to the immigration officer is prove that there's a legitimate relationship there. So they may ask you things like, um, you know, text messages uh, that you shared, uh, correspondence back and forth between the person. Maybe, hey, have you ever taken a picture with that person? Like, are you are you friends? Do you have a, a, a group photo where I can see both of you? Like the immigration officer is trying to establish that it's a true relationship. And if they can do so, they're going to issue the, the, the consular visa. Um, this, by the way, is not happening at our immigration department. It's happening at the embassy uh, that, that you're applying to, right? So this isn't a process that's happening uh, here necessarily. You can generate that letter, but uh, that person, uh, for example, if they're if they're a Thai citizen, they're going to have to go to the nearest embassy. I'm sure there's one in Bangkok. In fact, I'm pretty. Yeah, I remember there being one in Bangkok. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And another thing that's you know, increasing in popularity lately is this notion of birth tourism, i.e. if you have children in certain countries, you can fast track the uh, naturalization of the parents, fast track the citizenship of the parents, you know, Brazil and Chile and Argentina and some others are, are popular for that. Um, does that have any impact uh, on the process in El Salvador? 
Not, not in El Salvador. I mean, obviously, the child born in El Salvador uh, is a, a national of wherever your parents are from, based on their um, um, uh, uh, law of blood. And then uh, here, uh, they um, are also a Salvadoran citizen by virtue of the fact that they've been born here. But them, them being a citizen doesn't accelerate uh, the process of the parents. You still have to go through residency. But like I said, it's extraordinarily easy to get residency. Uh, so it's not like a, a great hurdle that you have to to clear in order to to live here and and raise your family. Yeah, you you mentioned that um, once the volcano bonds are launched, they're going to be used as a basically citizenship by investment program. Um, so you'll be able to buy them and, and maybe fast track citizen, citizenship. So one, do you have any information on uh, how quickly? Like, will it just be whenever the the transaction is is processed and the administration of this administrative stuff is done and you get your passport, let's say. Um, and two, what are your thoughts on that whole notion? You know, and I'll, I'll preface this by, you know, giving a little bit of my opinion. Of course, there's lots of countries in the world today where they have these programs, right? Typically smaller countries, island nations, but, you know, poor, bigger countries have them as well. And usually it ranges from, you know, a hundred K to half a million plus to invest in real estate, sanctioned investment funds, loan the government money, whatever, and you can get your 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 passport, your second or whatever citizenship. And I mean, I see it making sense, I guess, for certain jurisdictions. If you're in a small island nation with not a ton going on, maybe you're a bit of a tax haven, maybe you're a tourist destination. But it, you know, it's a highly transactional thing. Very few of those people want to live full time in those jurisdictions. They just want a second passport for whatever reason. Um but I, I, there's something icky I don't like about it. It's so transactional. Whereas in El Salvador, I feel like they have such an opportunity and they have been doing things so differently in so many different ways. Why not approach this thing differently as well? Not just to say, hey, you know, if you want one of our passports, you know, give us a hundred grand and, and you can get one or invest in our country in a hundred grand. I'd rather see, and I'm, you know, I'm being an idealist here, but I'd rather see them, uh, uh, you know, appreciate just how valuable, how much pent up the demand there actually is for intellectual, financial, and other forms of capital to come into the country and yes. say, we actually want to incentivize you to come into the country. Not, we don't just want to like make you pay a fine to get in basically. And then just, you know, stay here a month of the year or whatever, like come live, start a family, start a life, you know, really put in down roots. And because we, we appreciate so much all the forms of capital you bring with you and your enthusiasm and your, you know, ideological alignment and all those sorts of things, we're going to make it easy. We're going to actually incentivize you to do it. And that leaves you with more capital to invest in the country and to execute on your lifestyle. And we think that that will lead to a better outcome for the totality of the country and everyone in it, rather than just the government having, you know, a hundred thousand bucks every time somebody wants another passport. Uh, I'd love to see that. I don't know how you structure it. You know, maybe you pay a certain amount when you go in and for more years that you stay over 183 days, you get refunded on, on the, the money you've, you've invested or given who knows, but right. what's your opinion on, or sorry, the, the question regarding time, um, the timeline and the volcano investment, not when, not when they're offered, but presumably when they are offered, how well, fast that would lead to citizenship. And then your, your opinion on the such programs in general. Yeah, so um, I, I don't want to still President Bukele's thunder by any stretch of the imagination because uh, he he obviously wants to make an announcement about what they're proposing vis-a-vis uh, -vis the volcano bonds very shortly. Um, but I will tell you that um, I think a lot of people misunderstand uh, when when he got up on stage at the beach, right? And he said, hey, let's talk about Bitcoin City. Let's talk about the bonds. Blew everybody's mind. Uh, it, there was a big chart behind him that described what the bonds were doing. And um, at the very bottom, uh, it said that, uh, you know, holding a certain amount of the bonds would enable you to make a citizenship by investment application after a term of five years which is the same length of time that you go through for the normal residency process, right? right. Naturalization. Uh, so I, I, I don't know whether or not uh, the, the same parameters are there. I don't know whether or not there's a time and country requirement that might be waived uh, for, for the volcano bonds. Uh, 
Um, I'm going to be uh, very eagerly listening to his announcement uh, uh, as much or, or more so than, than all of the rest of you, I promise. Um, but I actually think I would agree with you. Uh, I, I think that residency is a more appropriate reward for investment than citizenship. Uh, citizenship to me is something that needs to be earned, right? I think that you should spend time in a country and uh, uh, become uh, culturally um, uh, acclimatized uh, to, to a country uh, before saying, I'm, I'm a citizen of that country. Uh, I get why smaller island nations do that. I Trust me, I do. Uh, and if you want, you can go and spend, you know, a couple hundred thousand bucks and get a Vanuatu passport. And, and that's great, you have that passport, but here's the reality is you're never going to integrate into Vanuatu society, right? You're not going to be able to buy land there. You're not going to become, uh, you know, one of the, the families that, you know, uh, uh, builds a dynasty in, in Vanuatu. Like that is locked down, <laughs> right? That's never going to change. Uh, but you do have that opportunity in a country the size of El Salvador. As small as it is, there's plenty of room to grow. So you can come here and you can say, well, not only do I hold a passport, but I also have uh, the chance to build dynasty uh, in, in the country. And, and I think that that's really the promise uh, that, that citizenship should hold for people. Um, it, it's a destination. But if you want the ability to come here and stay here for extended lengths of time, that's great. That's called residency. And I think that's entirely appropriate to give to someone who makes an investment or qualifies under some other program. Mm -hmm. Just back one second. You mentioned 10 minutes ago um, taxation, and you said there's a flat 5% uh, capital gains tax. Yeah. I'm assuming Bitcoin, by virtue of its legal tender status as money, is exempted from capital gains correct. tax in, in El Salvador? Yes. It, is, it is not subject to capital gains tax. Capital gains. Um, what's your current, I mean, how has your experience been using, interacting with, spending Bitcoin in the country, you know, for professional purposes, commer yeah. consumer, commercial, you know? Enlighten me. Yeah, so <laughs> I haven't had a bank account with dollars in it in years. Um, I, I've been personally Bitcoin only before I even came to El Salvador. Uh, so, so I'm a little bit of the wrong guy to ask that question because every single day I use Bitcoin in El Salvador, but I kind of cheat in, in, in a certain way, right? Like I, like I mentioned, I have a big team around me and um, uh, they're the ones that are interacting a, a lot with the public. Uh, and sometimes they have to interact with dollars. Uh, they do that and, and I reimburse them uh, quite well with Bitcoin. Um, uh, they all have Chivo wallet, so it's super easy uh, to do. I use the Chivo wallet, by the way, like not, not me personally, but I pay and interact with the Chivo wallet every single day and it works flawlessly why not um, you personally because only citizens can get chiva that's correct yeah you have to have the uh the the national identity number in order to to get a chiva wallet on your phone but as a foreigner you can use the atms you can pay to people that are using chiva wallet with any wallet that you want because it, it's a it's a bitcoin wallet and a dollar wallet uh and and, and everything is interchangeable so it's been good, your experience. You, you're not so, not yeah. being frustrated by stupid shit on a regular basis in terms of the going be, between the two and conducting the business. Time that I've been here, there have been uh, a couple of major areas that I haven't been able to to get a good solution around. Right, so. Um, Rent, paying your rent. Uh, almost all of the landlords are going to want dollars. Uh, some of them are orange pilled and they've got it figured out. Uh, some of them you can talk into uh, using a Chivo uh, app or, or, or whatever, and you're paying Bitcoin, but they see dollars, uh, right? But for the most part, paying rent is still a little bit difficult because land is typically owned by older, more conservative people, right? And uh, they're not the ones that are necessarily first generation technology adopters, right? Uh, so their their journey to Bitcoin is going to be a longer one. So you're probably going to have problems around uh, real estate uh, at this early stage of the game. And you're also going to have some issues uh, with big businesses. Uh, many big businesses accept it. Some haven't figured it out yet. Like it's still difficult to pay 
uh, your electricity bill, for example, uh, directly in Bitcoin. But we have services. We have BitRefill. They do a fantastic job. I don't think that it's cheating to use uh, a service like that because BitRefill buys a bunch of gift cards from the uh, from the electricity provider. I pay them. It's a three-way transaction, but it gets the job done. I don't have the friction of having to go out and and, and find dollars and track them down in order to, to pay. I can just uh, use a service. And so in the same way, you can have relationships with other people that, that do that as well. So um, but like I said, uh, many stores do. Uh, the, the grocery store, you can go and you can pay in Bitcoin uh, very easily. Uh, most vendors, uh, if you ask them uh, and you say, hey, like the only way I can pay you is if you whip out that Chico wallet, they're going to do it, right? Uh, not everybody, but a growing number. But what's really important about adoption is uh, a, a point that I raised with um, Stefan Levera on, on his podcast is I, I, I said, yes, it's true that not as many people have uh, adopted Bitcoin uh, on a daily basis as you might like to see, but no one has been forced to. No one is being forced to adopt Bitcoin. And more specifically, no one is being prevented from using Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. So that's something that's a night and day difference between El Salvador and maybe the rest of the world. There are several countries where it's outright illegal uh, to, to use it. There are several countries where it's de facto illegal to use it, like in the United States. I mean, you can technically go out and spend Bitcoin at a lot of places, but every time you do, it's a taxable event, you know? And if you're not reporting every one of those things, then you're technically in violation of the law. So it's de facto uh, improbable that you can use Bitcoin in those locations. So no one is preventing its use. No one is being forced to use it. And even with all of that libertarian permissiveness, we've still gotten 25% of the population in this short period of time that have really gripped on to the idea and are using it. And everyone else has the ability to do so like this. They they either have the wallet on their phone because they downloaded it for the 30 bucks or, or whatever. Maybe they haven't used it since, uh, but they either have it immediately where they could use it if they wanted to, or you know, within a few seconds, they could download any wallet and be able to use it. So we're much more ready for the technological shift that's about to happen vis-a-vis -vis our money and the traditional financial system than any other country on the world. Yeah. Well, that's always something that I think everyone noted was very attractive. You know, if you think the the current fiat currency paradigm is going to continue unraveling and perhaps at an accelerated rate, then isn't it, doesn't it behoove you to be in a place where at least the rails are somewhat familiar and established so that should that happen, there's not as much panic and people can more easily shift over to an alternative. And I think everyone probably answering the affirmative on that one. Uh, I only got three more for you because I know you got a hard stop in, in 20 minutes, but guns, you know, as we, we were talking about uh, freedom and liberty at the outset of this conversation, in my opinion, no conversation about those topics uh, is complete without a discussion of guns and the importance of uh, the citizens citizenry to be able to defend themselves against other citizens or the government. Uh, what is the? I, I haven't. I don't know much. I, I I thought I heard that you can own guns in El Salvador, but it's somewhat of a bureaucratic or difficult process. But what if if you know anything about that? Uh, I'd love to to know what the details are. It's just a license. You just apply for a license to own a gun and uh, they do a background check on you like they do a background check uh, in a lot of places. Uh, in the United States, you don't have a license uh, situation in, in most states, at least that, I, that I'm aware of. Uh, but uh, so there's a difference there. It, there isn't an inherent right to be able to buy uh, firearms, but all you have to do is just apply for the license to get it. I don't know anyone that has applied for it that hasn't gotten it. It's a, it's a pretty straightforward process. I think that if you had recently committed a violent crime, uh, someone's going to ask you some questions about that. Maybe you don't get the, the, the license. I don't know. Um, but, but that's as easy of a process as it is. And, and you can own a lot of different types of firearms. You can't own like giant machine guns, but you can have your pistols, your shotguns, your rifles, your long guns, all, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, you can manufacture your own. There's no rules against that. So, you know, uh, we're just talking about the, the the purchase and the license to own. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's not as permissive as um, the, the United States would lead you to believe it is. And it's not exactly very permissive in, in some places. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's not terribly difficult. And if, if you're granted a license, there's gun shops and stuff, that's where you purchase oh, the firearms in El Salvador? Uh, really? El Salvador 
is very heavily armed. <laughs> I just, I want people to understand that before they come. Like you yourself have been in San Salvador, so you know what it's like. You drive down the road and every block there's some guy toting a shotgun, you know, they're guarding the store. Don't get me wrong. It's not like right. he's down, but there are firearms uh, everywhere. And uh, and not just in the security personnel, but a, a very high rate of, of personal ownership as well. Okay, well, that's encouraging, at least, to know that there's access to, e easy enough access to a certain set of guns. I mean, not fully unrestricted, let's say, but... Yeah, um, I mean, so San Salvador, you know the size of San Salvador. It's got like, you know, a million and a half, two million people or something like that. And I would guess that there are two dozen gun stores, wow. something like that. So it's not like it's just the one or it's right, like right. watched or anything like that. Uh, you, you can pretty much uh, go and, and, and open one, you know? Interesting. All right. The the next thing is um, real estate. You know, I'm sure a lot of people have been eyeballing things. I think it seems to me it's kind of tough to get legit information online. You probably it's probably one of the cases where you have to to be there. But and I think in most places, especially over the last two years, coastal property has kind of gone through the roof. Doesn't matter if you're in Costa Rica or El Salvador or wherever. Um, but generally speaking, I mean, what's What's the process of of buying property in El Salvador? Presumably, you can own it outright. I know you have to make sure the titles are correct and stuff before you buy. You know, coastal, mountainous, temperate zone, city. What's what's your you know? Hit me with your impressions on buying real estate in El Salvador. Yeah, it's pretty easy to do. It's freehold. So you when you buy a piece of property, like you own it yourself, and there's no weird lease, hundred year or something kind of right. situation. Like we, we don't do any of that. You, you get free hold title. Um, you do need to research the title of any property that you're about to buy. Just to make sure that it's free of liens, um, it, especially if it hasn't changed hands in a long time or if it's not being done through like a development. If you come down and you buy like a lot in a subdivision with a house on it, you're going to be fine. That's a very easy transaction to do. You don't have to worry about your due diligence. It's when you want to go out to, you know, this rare slice of jungle in the, you know, in Uslatan and, and, and no one knows who actually owns it for the last 50 years. Like that's when you need to get a lawyer involved and, and really do some diligence. Uh, but but if you are confident in the uh, the provenance of the title uh, and you are able to make an agreement with the, the seller, you don't need any third parties. You can just do it. Right. And now uh, there the seller side has to register it and they, they have to pay a fee to, to the government when they uh, uh, do all of that. And you probably want an attorney uh, to, to get involved in the process. But it can be just as simple as uh, shaking hands and, and, and doing that deal. Um, you can pay in Bitcoin. Uh, so there have been many uh, commercial transactions and residential transactions for property uh, in uh, denominated in Bitcoin. So uh, uh, that's certainly a possibility. There aren't as many sellers that are willing to accept it, but some are, uh, especially for lower value uh, uh, parcels, right? Um, but other than that, the major challenge around buying property is, is if you have to do it in dollars, getting that number of dollars into the country. It's always uh, an issue. But hopefully we'll have a solution on that uh, here very shortly. I'm not going to, uh, again, step on anybody's uh, uh, thunder, but uh, uh, we'll have a, a good solution for that very, very shortly. And as far as like the geography of the, the country, uh, obviously you've got highlands, you've got lowlands, you've got the far west, the far east. If you are lower ground, uh, lower to the, to the ocean level, uh, you're gonna be hotter and muggier, okay? If you're higher elevation, uh, it's gonna be a little bit cooler, a little bit windier, right? Uh, so you can find- That's what find, I'm talking about. Yeah, you you're gonna- Coolness and windiness. You, depending on, on what it is that you want. like. I love visiting the beach, but I couldn't like live there year round. Like it's just, it would be too much for me. So where I live in Colonia Escalon, it's kind of nice. It's right up uh, about halfway up the volcano. We get nice breezes constantly. And I'll, I'll say this, like I've been living here for a while now. I haven't really run my air conditioner like at all. So, I mean, it's a comfortable, uh, normal, workable environment and temperature. So uh, you can find what you want here. It just depends on uh, where you want to go. Yeah. And I know pricing questions are tough because it yeah. spans the spectrum, but yeah. I mean, for those looking for ideal land to kind of sit on and then build something in the future in that kind of temperate zone, thousand feet up, whatever it might be, um, 
are those opportunities around is is the Absolutely. like that's a that sort of thing is available and if so do you have any experience on you know people that have done it before and prices they've paid and that kind of stuff yeah so um again prices are going to vary so widely here that there are incredible deals uh but there are also parcels that are <laughs> in my opinion overpriced right right, uh, right. so so you're going to run the gamut but i'm going to tell you that uh, I almost uh, throw up a little bit in my mouth when I when I say this, but you're going to want to use Facebook Marketplace uh, because that's what everybody here uses, right? So you you should set up a Facebook account just to have access to Facebook Marketplace, and uh, because people are posting land deals there, they're they're posting all sorts of things for sale. It's the Craigslist of El Salvador, so get used to that. There are a couple of other websites that do a halfway decent job. But that's really where the, uh, the 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 real deals are. So be prepared for that, and uh, you know, go ahead and uh, have that application uh, ready that you can log into. But um, yeah, and then you're going to want to make phone calls in Spanish. That's going to be the the challenge. Is you're going to get a phone number, and you're going to need to to reach out and talk to the owner and explain the situation and get their lowdown. And they're not going to speak English, uh, so you're going to either need to speak Spanish fluently or have someone help you. Gotcha. Um, all right. The last one, I think a couple of weeks ago, you you tweeted out, you know, you had some some spicy news or a scoop or something and you were you were seeing who wants it. And I saw the tweet and, you know, scoops aren't my type of thing. But now that I have you here, I don't know if you discussed it somewhere else, but what were you referring to then, if you can share? Um, you're going to have to refresh my memory because I, I, I oh, OK, well, now, if you don't remember, then I, I guess it wasn't that out of a scoop, yeah, but you were saying yeah. something like, you know, I got, I got some interesting news, you know, I want to talk about it on a podcast. Who wants to, who wants to, to, uh, to discuss oh, it? But. Yes, 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 yes. It's, oh, I, I do want to tell you. Um, so I'm, I'm trying, I'm looking at the clock here because it's going to be, oh, so here's the, here's the situation, right? Uh, if you are a U.S. person or a Canadian, uh, and I think there's some other countries too, you can't open a Bitfinex account right? You just can't do it. They won't serve you. It's their prerogative as a private company. But the problem is that Bitfinex is the only place that's going to list the volcano bonds, right? If you're uh, a and, Canadian or American resident? Correct. That, yeah. Okay, okay. Well, you're in, if you're a citizen or if you're in that, that physical jurisdiction, they just won't let you open the account, right? But if you're a citizen, let's say in El Salvador, is that they still won't? Well, you still can't. Like if, if you're a prohibited person, like if okay. you're an American citizen in El Salvador, you cannot open a Bitfinex account. Gotcha. But here's what you can do. Uh, you can own a foreign company that has the ability to open a Bitfinex account as long as you meet certain requirements. Like there's some ownership requirements uh, and, and other things. Uh, but Bitfinex will then allow you to have a corporate account uh, with them that can purchase uh, the volcano bonds. So the reason why that was a bit of, a bit spicy or a bit of a scoop is that for a long time, we thought that we were going to have a partner that was going to be able to sell volcano bonds to at least accredited investors in the United States. Uh, but apparently that's not going to be the case anymore. So uh, it's just Bitfinex. And the only way to get them is to to, to go through this rather circuitous route of having a, a private shell company. Um, and so that's all I can say about it right now. But uh, but that is a possibility. And uh, so if you are if you're a U.S. person and, and you really, really, really want to have uh, an access or exposure to the volcano bonds, it is possible. Well, it seems like those are going to be pretty popular vehicles because I have to imagine that a lot of the potential investors in volcano bonds would be American and Canadian, like a huge portion. So. <laughs> All right. Um, that's it for me. I know you got a, another call very shortly. Anything you wanted to get out there, shill or just a, you know, a topic you want to bring to people's attention before we shut it down? The floor is yours. Visit us for adopting Bitcoin in November. It's a great time to see the country, meet a lot of uh, like-minded individuals, uh, kick the tires, and uh, hopefully I'll be around. And uh, yeah, just come and see me. Awesome. Jeremy, thanks so much for the time and the information and all that kind of stuff. Wish you the best, and I'm sure we'll be, uh, we'll be in touch. So take care. Sounds great. See you. Bye. See you, brother.